Okay, we, we are going to now have a, a Dr. Dr. Nathaniel West. He is our a department chair of Christian formation and, and an assistant professor of, of Christian education. Some of you who've had him know he is a phenomenal professor. He's a phenomenal professor. Um, and, and I'm grateful. And he is my self-appointed watchdog, so, so I, I appreciate him. Come on, put your hands together for Dr. West as he comes. <laughs> Good morning. I am so grateful for the opportunity to uh, share with you this morning. I thank Dean Guns for this even t invitation to uh, present. Uh, I also want to thank my uh, colleagues in the School of Theology, uh, faculty and staff who love and support me. And I also want to give thanks to our forever Dean, Dr. John Kinney. Yeah. Now, now, I do think our class has something over the rest of the classes who call him the forever dean because our class started the year that he started being the dean. So he's been our dean since the beginning. So he is really our forever, forever dean. All y'all who came after. <laughs> I thank you for this opportunity to, uh, to share, and I, I'm, I'm grateful to my friend, Dr. Lance Watson, who preached. So that I can stay in my Ella, my, um, uh, at core, I'm an educator. So I teach. And today I want to teach about emotional intelligence. I want to start with think you give you this story. I remember uh, years ago when I was when I was serving full time in ministry at a local church, and there were since the church was uh, what at that time was called a mega church, there were n numeral people who were on staff. We have numeral uh, many ministers who were paid staff full time. And I remember during this particular time, one of my colleagues for about a week. He was throwing jabs at me, just pushing my buttons. You know, but I was so engrossed in the work of the church. I was also engrossed in my PhD studies, and I also was engrossed in trying to raise a family with small children. And so as he was pushing my button, I just ignored it. I didn't, I didn't pay attention to it, I just ignored it. I knew what was happening, but I ignored it because I didn't have the time because I was too busy doing what I thought I should be doing. And this went on for about a week. And then one Sunday morning, because on Sunday mornings, those of us, because of our positions, we were required to sit in the pulpit. And on Sunday morning, in the pulpit, he threw some other jabs at me. And at that point, I recognized I was getting angry. But service went on, and I didn't do nothing. I just went home. And then the next morning, Mondays, because we always had staff meetings on Monday mornings. And so on this particular, this particular morning, all of us were waiting in the hallway to go into the conference room. And because, you know, the room was locked and we were waiting for somebody to come. And then he said a couple of more things. And at that time, I had an intrapersonal volcano. I cannot tell you what I said other than the one cuss word I said. Now, Dr. Guns, because of all the cussing that was going on yesterday in here, I was wondering, could I say it? <laughs> but it was the F word, and I'm not talking about faith. I blew up. And everybody in that hallway stopped because they were in shock about what happened. 
And so him and I were able to sit down and talk and walk through that. Today, I couldn't even tell you what the concern was. But upon reflection of that, I recognized that I was not emotionally intelligent. Because at that time, what I recognized in reflection at that, uh, going over that time is that I was not paying attention to my emotions, and what I was really doing was suppressing them or ignoring them. And that moment was not only about that moment, that really was a moment of weeks and months and maybe years of suppressing things to the point where I couldn't take it anymore, and I blew up. I didn't understand that 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 we had to, that I had to take care of my being. I knew all I needed to do to be in ministry, what to do, but nobody had taught me how to be. And so and so in that moment, I exploded. And since that time, I've been very intentional about understanding who I am. What are the things that trigger me? What are the things that gets on my nerves? How do I manage what I am express, what am I feeling, what I am going through in times of happiness or in times of sadness? So in concert with the theme of the convocation, preaching matters, what I want to suggest is not only does preaching matter, but the preacher matters. And in saying this, I'm not suggesting that we have to choose between the two because they both matter, and as clergy, we benefit when we attend to the preacher and the preaching. However, I am implying that sometimes we put more emphasis and energy into the preaching than we do the preacher. Preaching speaks to what we do, Preacher speaks to an aspect of who we are. Emphasizing what we do as ministers is not a shock to me because it is aligned with the Western culture that we live in where we honor our doing more than we do our being. Western culture admires, respects, and exalts what we do at the expense of who we are. Sometimes clergy, like many Americans, promote their doing instead of their being. When asked to introduce ourselves, we give people our resume. A resume that is outlined with what we have done. We introduce to others our doing and not our being. Doing is generally about our vocation and our career and our accomplishments. These are things that can be measured and highlighted. We can measure and highlight the number of members we have, the amount of tithes and offerings we collected, the degrees we earned, the number of revivals we preach, the number of new members we have virtually since the pandemic, the numerous roles we have in our respective denominations. Doing is tangible. It is concrete and physical. Being, on the other hand, is focused more on the intangibles. It is about our inner selves, our character, about who we are. Being speaks to the type of persons we are internally, which is generally not measured in the way our accomplices, our accomplishments are measured. Doing is concerned about how we make a living, while being is concerned about how we make a life. Let me say this again. Doing is concerned about how we make a living while being is concerned about how we make a life. And although Western culture teaches us to put our energy into doing or making a living, I believe that God does not want us to forget our being so we can make a life. Let me share with you a scripture that would help us understand that even more. Many of us are familiar with the scripture about Moses at the burning bush in the book of Exodus. Well, God has this conversation with Moses about God's concern for the people of Israel and how God was going to use Moses and God's plan to deliver the Israelites. And in this conversation, Moses proposed many questions to God in this encounter with God, but I'm especially drawn to the questions he asked in Exodus 
chapter 3, verses 13 and 14. In their conversation, Moses says to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God's response to Moses' question was not about God's doing. God could have easily outlined God's resumes to Moses. God should have said, well, Moses, tell them. I'm the God that created the heavens and the earth when the earth was formless and empty. I'm the God that said, let there be light, and there was light, and I named that light day and night. I'm the God that said, let there be a vault between the waters to separate water from water, and it was so, and I called the vault sky. I'm the God that said, let the water under the sky be gathered to one place and let dry ground appear, and it was so, and I called the dry ground land, and the ga gathered waters I called sea. I'm the God who said, let the land produce vegetation, and it was so. I could tell them, I'm the God who said, let there be light in the vault of the sky to support the day from the night, and it was so. I'm the God who created the great creatures of the race and every living thing with the water turned and that moves in it according to their kind and every winged bird according to its kind. I'm the God who said, let the land produce living creatures according to their kind. The livestock, the creatures that move along the ground and the wild animals, each according to his kind. And it was so. I'm the God who said, let us make mankind in our own image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish and the sea and the birds and the sky, over the livestock and the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move on the ground. God said, I created mankind in my own image. Moses, you can tell them, I created them. But God did not give Moses a list of God's accomplishments or a record of God's achievements. God's response to Moses' question was, I am who I am. Not I am what I do, but I am who I am. I be who I be. Not a discourse or litanies, litany of achievements, but I am who I am. I wonder if God wanted Moses to know that God's existence was more about God's being than God's doing. What God does is important, but not at the expense of who God is. By God focusing on God's being, God gave Moses the permission to walk in who he was. Moses was so concerned. The reason Moses was having all these questions, he was concerned about what he was going to do based on what God was calling him to do. And God was trying to help Moses understand, I'm not sending you so much to do. I'm sending you so much to be. And if you be who you are, I can do what I need to do through you based on who you are. Could it be that we are so busy doing that we miss the mark? Could it be that sometimes we mistake our work for God's work? Because we are trying to be in relationship with God by what we do. And God is longing to be in relationship with us by who we are. Could God simply be saying to us, if you would just be, that I can do my work through your being, and you would be free from trying to do my work, because some of which I'm calling you to do you can't do it by yourself. But if you would be, then I can do it through you. I want to propose that we as clergy, as ministers, as preachers, need to make a shift. Since we have spent a lot of time and energy focusing on achievements and accomplishments that can be, rec that can be recorded in our ministry yearbooks, 
let's make a shift and put some energy and focus on being that can be recorded in our ministry life books. In this season of my life, I am focusing on the being of clergy because who you are matters. More specifically, I'm now focusing on the emotional intelligence as it pertains to clergy because emotional intelligence is important because it's a facet of how clergy can care for their beings and how a healthy relationship with emotions is beneficial for ministers. I'm presently conducting research about emotional intelligence, sometimes called emotional quotient, particularly as it relates to clergy. And what I've discovered in research and in my own experience is that being emotionally intelligent is a powerful tool in the minister's toolbox. Many of the tools that we have, such as homiletical methods and pastoral care and counseling skills, teaching strategies and leadership styles, are doing tools. Tools to help us positively, positively impact the lives of others. Emotional intelligence is a being tool that is designed for clergy to help themselves. And from my perspective, clergy should be proactive in adding favorable tools to their clergy toolboxes because the demands of ministry require ministers to be as healthy as possible. When I think about the responsibilities that we have as clergy in general and pastors in specifically, it just makes my head spin. The job description for clergy is so diverse and demanding. There are many, new, many leadership roles that clergy are expected to fulfill, including preacher and teacher, administrator, visionary, counselor, social justice advocate, and because of the pandemic, IT specialist, to name a few. Each of these roles are not only complex, they require highly divisive, diverse com competen com com competencies. Thank you so much. A company with these roles and responsibilities are stressors that take a toll on a minister's mental and emotional health. Clergy responsibilities are made even more complicated when we take into account that ministers frequently transition between roles on a daily and weekly basis. A minister on one day may have to attend a meeting with the finance committee and leave that meeting to conduct premarital counsel with a couple and leave that meeting to counsel a couple who's contemplating divorce and leave that meeting to meet with the church leadership. The next day, she may attend to visiting members in the hospital and on one floor is a mother and father excited about their newborn, and on another floor is a family contemplating whether or not they should take their loved one off of support. These various responsibilities not only require clergy to, to possess certain skills, but the skills don't always transfer from one responsibility to another. They also require clergy to expend a lot of emotional labor. If clergy reflected on the various emotions they experience in a day or a week or a month, I imagine they would be surprised. The range of emotions that we experience while fulfilling our roles can be stuff like be peaceful, surprised, angry, respected, let down, disrespected, inspired, thankful, annoyed, depressed, confident, and excited, just to name a few. Clergy may not only be surprised by the number of emotions they experience, but also the intensity of those emotions. The emotional labor that we exert is great. We are so used to fulfilling our roles and the task that accompanies these roles that many of us don't even consider the emotional highs and lows that we endure. Not only do clergy have com complex roles and demanding roles and responsibilities, you've got to do these things with people. And unlike Jesus, we don't get to choose the people. But even if we were able to choose the people, like Jesus, he still had problems with the one he handpicked. 
Clergy are called to be in ministry with people. And ministry at its core is relational. Ministry is dependent on relationships. A relationship is simply a connection between people, and the connections that we have with people are also emotional. Ministry dictates that clergy engage in various social and emotional interactions, and these interactions contribute to the stressors that ministers encounter. To help clergy navigate the varied relationships and the mental and emotional stressors they encounter, I propose that emotional intelligence is a necessary tool for our toolbox. In his work, Goldman promotes emotional intelligence as one of the most beneficial tools, both personally and professionally, that a person can have. The relationship that clergy engage in are social in nature, and they require clergy to constantly and consistently interact with people. Preachers preach to people they are connected to. They proclaim visions to people they are connected to. They teach people they are connected with. They do ministry with people they are connected with. And they lead people they are connected to. And these relationships, both healthy and unhealthy, have an emotional toll on the minister's health. We have members who are supportive, members who are not supportive, members who are neutral. But all of that drained the preacher's emotional state. Let me give you an example. Back to Moses. So we know that Moses accepted uh, 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 God's call and, and accepted what God wanted him to do. And Moses did what God wanted him to do uh, 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 and, and until he finally got to the point where, he, where, where Pharaoh agreed to let the people go. And, and, and in Exodus chapter 14, uh, verse number 10, it says, As Pharaoh approached the Israelites, Israelites looked up, and there were the Egyptians marching after them. They were terrified and cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us to the desert to die? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone? Let us serve the Egyptians? It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. Moses answered the people, do not be afraid. Stand firm, and you will see the deliverance of the Lord that will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. Then the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to move on. After Moses accepted this call to lead the Israelites out of Egypt, and after he approached Pharaoh time after time after time to let the Israels go, when Pharaoh's firstborn died, he finally agreed to let the Israelites go. And then when they left, Pharaoh thought twice about it. And he sent his army after them. You know, I imagine that when the Israelites received the news, that after being in captivity for 430 years, that they were finally going to be free, that they were excited, they were ecstatic, they were optimistic, and they were hopeful. I imagine that even some of the Israelites went to Moses and expressed their gratitude for what Moses did in helping them get the freedom from the Egyptians. However, their excitement was replaced with fear when they saw Pharaoh's army marching, marching after them. Their excitement was replaced with fear, and their fear led them cry out, cry out to God. They cried out to God, but they accused and blamed Moses. The emotional state of the Israelites was manifested in behavior that accused the one who sacrificed his life and his family to take an assignment he didn't want. Moses took an assignment he didn't ask for. He was on his way to fulfill his assignment because he was already assured by God that God would defeat Pharaoh's army. However, the very people he sacrificed for were turning on him. The scripture doesn't explicitly state what Moses was feeling, but we know Moses was feeling something because he cried out to God based on God's response to him, why are you crying out to me? I suspect that Moses was crying out to God because he was frustrated. Frustrated because the people he was called to lead were now turning on him. 
This pericope is just an example of the emotional roller coaster that clergy experience in their relationships with the people they are called to lead. The same people that we sacrifice for are sometimes the same people who will praise, who will praise and prosecute us even while we're doing God's will. The deacon that you visited in the hospital and prayed for his healing is now the same deacon that resists you getting a raise. The couple that you counseled when they were having marriage difficulties are now publicly questioning the vision you got from God. You spend hours praying and fasting and planning to preach relative sermons, transformational Bible studies, and members boldly make an appointment with you to tell you they don't even feel like they're being fed. Ministry is an experience of emotional extremes. The emotional pendulum can swing from joy from preaching a sermon that resonated with the people to sorrow on that same day when you get the, inform when you get the, the record from the offerings that were way below budget. <laughs> Ministry has its own emotional roller coaster and emotional intelligence will help clergy to, uh, to attend their emotions in a healthy manner. Embracing emotional intelligence is an act of self-care because it allows us to be proactive and not reactive. Our emotional states matter because they can determine if we even stay in ministry. Hogan Winder's study revealed that emotional states of burnout, frustration, feeling constrained, and a sense of inadequacy are primary reasons for clergy leaving the ministry. Conflict is another factor that clergy have to navigate in ministry. It's a given that clergy who are in leadership positions will have conflict. Sometimes we desire to ignore it or avoid it, but Jenkins discovered that clergy are often required to have the ability to successfully manage situations of conflict, especially in situations where the emotions run high. The good news is emotional intelligence has been identified as a positive factor for issues such as conflict management. There was a study that the uh, Boyces and Brits and Godwin studied the impact of religious leaders, emotional intelligence, and social competencies. And their study indicates that emotional intelligence leaders, religious leaders, are a benefit for ministry. In short, emotional intelligence has been shown to be beneficial for clergy because of the very demands and complexities of ministry and the emotional states that we engage in. So what is emotional intelligence? Psychologists Peter Salovey and John Meyer are pioneers in emotional intelligence. Their definition of emotional intelligence is the ability to monitor one's own and others' feelings and emotions to discriminate among them, and to use this information to guide one thinking and action. They are, their, 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 their model is what most people use and most people quote when they talk about emotional intelligence. And there are four areas to their model. Identifying emotions, uh, using emotions, understanding emotions, and managing emotions. Identifying emotions is the ability to recognize one's own feelings and the feelings of those that they are interacting with. To identify one's own emotions is just one aspect of this phase in the model. Identify the emotions of others is another aspect. It is important that persons are able to perceive emotions not only in themselves, but also in those around them. Using emotion is the ability to access those emotions and use reason with it in our thought process and our decision-making processes. Understanding emotions have the ability to uh, identify and comprehend the emotions that we are feeling and those around us. This could, we, understanding emotions helps us to understand the cause and effect of emotions. And then managing emotions is really regulating our emotions and managing them in others. In the pericope I discussed earlier with Moses and the Israelites, I believe that although Moses was attacked by the Israelites, 
he was using some aspects of emotional intelligence. When, his, when, when the people uh, were asking him why he didn't let them stay and they could have stayed and, and, and accusing him, Moses' response to the people, so what Moses didn't do was match the emotional energy of the people. He said to them, because he recognized their fear, he said, do not be afraid. Moses was trying to get them to come down. He said, don't be afraid, and he gave them assurance that the God who brought us this far is already going to take us to where we need to be. And so Moses understood, he interpreted what, they were, what the emotions they were having, he understood their emotions, and he used it in a thought process to make a decision to help them bring them down, and he regulated their emotions. Could you imagine if Moses would have gotten in a shouting battle with them? While they're shouting and fussing, the Egyptian army was going to come take them out. But Moses used emotional intelligence to help them move toward the goal. See, this is one of the reasons why we want to use emotional intelligence, because when we don't, we get off focus about the goals and objectives and the plan that God has for us. So Moses said, do not be afraid. He was dealing with the inter and intrapersonal aspects of himself. Our interpersonal aspects is just simply the relation, our interpersonal aspects are the relationships that we have with others. Salve and Meyer state that from an evolutionary standpoint, it was important that people be able to perceive emotions not only in themselves, but also in those around them. Having this ability to identify emotions ensures smoother interpersonal cooperation. Gardner states that the core capacity of interpersonal intelligence helps in understanding and interacting with others. Persons with strong interpersonal intelligence can assess the emotions, desires, and intentions of others. Simply put, they can both understand people and relate to them. Our interpersonal selves is the relationship with ourselves. Garter's important work with multiple intelligence notes that the core capacity of interpersonal intelligence is to be able to access one's own emotions, what Meyer and Salovey call identifying our emotions. The inability to accurately identify one's own emotions or the emotions of others can have a negative consequence because generally emotions influence behavior and misunderstanding our emotions or the emotions of others can lead to inaccurate behavior. So let me talk just a couple of minutes about the emotional brain. I know our time is rolling. The emotional brain. And so there are two, 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 two functions uh, of the brain that deal with the emotion. The cortex, which is the thinking brain, and the amygdala, which is the, the, uh, the, the emotional brain. Uh, and, and so my, so my time, so let me just say this. So, so, so when we are, the, 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 the thinking brain is, is the process when we get emotional stimuli, that, the, the, that, these, those, that stimuli gets to our thinking brain, and our, because our thinking brain is where all of our uh, discussions with ourselves and our, and our processes are going on, our decision-making process, so that we can process it in a rational way so that we can make a decision and to have appropriate behavior. The amygdala is the emotional brain, and it's a part of the brain's limbic system, which is responsible for our emotional behavioral responses. The amygdala is a cluster of almond-shaped cells located near the base of the brain, and the amygdala purpose is to define and regulate emotions. And so what, 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 what happens is that the amygdala, particularly when we find ourselves with a threat, the amygdala will process that stimuli and put us in the fight, flight, or freeze mode. Because what happens is that the amygdala will override the thinking brain because the amygdala is trying to make sure if the threat that we are facing is so imminent that we need to act. 
And so in evolutionary times, when, when, when men or women were faced with the threat of, threat of death or the threat of, you know, like a bear or a lion or whatever came under them, the amygdala kicked in. It's like the alarm system for the brain. And the amygdala would kick in to let them know either you got to fight or you got to flight. You got to get out of here. But today we don't have as much about the, uh, the physical threat. In other words, the threats that we have are not life and death. But what we do have are psychological threats. We have psychological stressors that we have to deal with. And so what happens when we are, when, when, when somebody tries to manipulate us or somebody tries to get over on us or somebody disrespects us, the amygdala checks in and says that's a threat. And therefore, what you need to do is you got to respond because the amygdala does not wait for us to think about it. It acts on its own. And so the amygdala will act on its own, what is called the amygdala hijacked. And so the amygdala will hijack the rational brain and act emotionally, and then we generally will act in a way that is not the best behavior. Let me make it plain. The incident that I had was an amygdala hijack. I wasn't able to process all that was going on with me in that moment because I felt threatened. And because I felt threatened, the amygdala kicked in, and then I said the F word. This is my concern for clergy, is because when the amygdala, amygdala kicks in, it also kicks in, there, 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 there are two parts of the nervous system, the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. And so what the amygdala does, it, it, it kicks into the sympathetic nervous system, which is the system that puts us in the fight or flight mode. And it, and it prepares us for what we see as a perceived danger. And so the heartbeat will increase, the muscles will tense up, the pupil will dilate, the hands will get sweaty, we'll start saliva. And so we get into the, 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 the sympathetic nervous system Now this and the, versus the parasympathetic nervous system, which is there to keep us in balance and calm. My concern for clergy, if we don't use emotional intelligence, is that we operate too much in the sympathetic nervous system to the point where we think that being in fight or flight is normal. The country that we live in, in this Western society, is always pushing us to do, 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 do. And then clergy take that to another level because we, we, we equate our doing with God's will. And so we're always doing, doing, going, going. No, the Lord told me to do that. The Lord told me to do this. The Lord said, I don't need no rest. I'll get some rest when I get it. And so we operate in the sympathetic nervous system, which means that we are always in chaos. And God is trying to help us to see, I didn't create your body to be always or, or for you to over-regulate um, the sympathetic nervous system. That's not the way I created you. Because this is what happens with an overactive sympathetic nervous system. This is why we have anxiety. This is why we have panic attacks. This is why we have nervousness. This is why we have breathlessness. This is why we have palpitations. This is why we can't relax. This is why we can't sit still. This is why we're jumpy and jittery. This is why we have poor digestion. This is why we got fear. This is why we have diabetes. This is why we have high blood pressure. This is why we have high cholesterol, because we're operating in a part of our system that wasn't designed for us to be in perpetual state. And so the emotional intelligence will get us back to the parasympathetic, parasympathetic 
nervous system. And let me just say this. Uh, emotional intelligence isn't anything new. It's in, the, it's in the Bible. In Mark 14, 32, it says they went to a place called Gethsemane, and Jesus said, this is just one example. Jesus says to his disciples, sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James, and John along with him, and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, he said to them. Stay here and keep watch. As a, as a reminder, what I see in this text is Jesus using emotional intelligence. Remember I said the Salovey's model was, was identifying your emotions, using your emotions, understanding your emotions, and regulating or managing your emotions. Verse 33 states that Jesus was deeply distressed and troubled. And to, in response to what he felt, he said, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Jesus recognized what he was feeling at this most critical point in his journey. He was so distressed that it was overwhelming. And he was deeply saddened to the point that it felt like death. In the midst of this impactful emotional moment, Jesus was able to identify what he was feeling and he understood what he was feeling. The emotions were so intense that Jesus asked for the cup to be taken from him. But because he understood what he was feeling, he was able to reason about it and eventually regulate his emotions so that he can stay on track to what God had called him to do. These verses in Mark tell us a couple of things about emotional intelligence. One is it's very important for us to identify our, emotional, our emotions. The process of emotional intelligence can be so intense at times that we need God to help us process what we are feeling. Sometimes we're not able to do it on our own. Sometimes we don't understand it, but it is necessary. Regulating our emotions can be a process. Jesus had to go through a process till he got to the point where he asked to take the cup away until he said, until he eventually said, but not my will, but thy will. Effectively regulating our emotions will keep us in God's will. My brothers and sisters, I just finally want to say to you that it will be beneficial for us to be intentional to activate and embrace emotional intelligence. And let me just say this. Because of the stressors and the demands and the complexities of ministries that we, that we face, some of the things that we do to try to uh, uh, soothe the hurt and the pain is not going to be helpful. I know it's legal, but another joint ain't going to do it. Another drink isn't going to do it. Having multiple sex partners isn't going to do it. We need to embrace what we have within us, what God already has given us, so that we can be whole. And let me just conclude with this. Uh, if we rely on deficits in emotional intelligence, we're going to have many problems in adjustment that may arise from a deficit of emotional intelligence. People who don't learn to regulate their own emotions may become servants to them. Individuals who can't recognize emotions in others or who make others feel badly may be perceived as crude, rough, uncivilized, and ultimately be ostracized. A far more com common ailment may involve people who cannot recognize emotion in themselves and are therefore unable to plan lives that fulfill them emotionally. Such planning deficits may lead to lives of unrewarded experience lived by individuals who may become depressed. A society, a society of such individuals could create a culture in which people are insuffici insufficiently rewarded and so regulate, regulate their emotions in alienating ways. The person with emotional intelligence can be thought of as having attained at least a limited form of positive mental health. These individuals are aware of their own feelings and those of others. They're open to positive and negative aspects of internal experience, are able to label them, and when appropriate, communicate them. Such awareness will often lead to the effective regulation of effect within themselves and others and contribute to their well-being. Thus, the emotional intelligent person 
is often a pleasure to be around and leaves others feeling better. The emotionally intelligent person, however, does not mindlessly seek pleasure, but rather attends to emotion in the path toward growth. Emotional intelligence involves self-regulation, appreciative of the fact that temporarily hurt feelings or emotional restraint is often necessary in the service of a greater objective. Emotional intelligent individuals actively perceive their emotions and use integrative approach to regulate them so that they can proceed toward the important goals. I just wish with you, and my prayer for you, is that you honor this aspect of yourself so that your mental and emotional health can put you in the place where you don't dread going to church, but you enjoy going to church. God bless you.